This is Twit. So, uh, on uh, podcast Tuesday of March 5th, so that's what? Uh, Three months. I'm <laughs> really February, February, off my game. February, March, two months from now. Uh, Robert Joyce, a senior advisor with the U.S. National Security Agency, will be offering his, the, uh, t- his talk titled, at, this is at the, NSA, at the RSA, RSA yeah, yeah, yeah. conference, Come Get Your Free NSA Reverse Engineering Tool. Oh, jeez. Yeah. The uh, Robert's talk abstract reads, NSA has developed a software reverse engineering framework known as Ghydra. And I did some Googling thinking, okay, I mean, it's got IDA in it. So that was a a clue because that's interactive disassembler IDA. Ah. And so they kind of crammed. And then Ghydra is something from Final Fantasy V. An enemy fought at... Ronka ruins alone <laughs> and can also be fought in the battle with an alchemia. It is a dangerous foe and it has auto reflect and battles using poison breath and lightning. <laughs> and well, it was also a, a many headed serpent in Greek mythology. I mean, it was well, that was just a hydra, right? Yeah, H Y D R A. Yeah, oh, so, so this is more G-H- letters. I-D-R-A. Oh, yeah, we got more letters in there. I-D-R-A. Anyway, so whatever the heck, uh, it will be demonstrated. It sounds like for the Ghidra. First... Maybe Ghidra. Ghid... Okay. I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure that there's got to be some Final Fantasy people around listening. That's interesting. About that. So it's a Final Fantasy character. Yeah. Huh. Uh, so um, it's going to be demonstrated for the first time at the RSA Conference 2019. He says an interactive GUI capability enables reverse engineers to leverage an integrated set of features that run on a variety of platforms, including Windows, Mac, and Linux. And it's written in Java and supports a variety of processor instruction sets. The, whatever we call it, Gehydra (laughs) platform includes all the features expected in, this is the, the NSA bragging in high-end commercial tools with new and expanded functionality NSA uniquely developed and will be released for free public use at RSA. It was also in Vault 7. Yes, we first learned of it. In, <laughs> of, we learned of it in the Vault Seven. So we've Wikileaks. had it for a while. <laughs> well, we, we've known we've known of it, yeah. but it's it's apparently it's been evolving. Ah. So the WikiLinks yeah. quoted version was seven point zero point two. Uh, we know that it requires Java uh, one point seven. So according to the Vault Seven documents, Gehydra. Uh, for, for lack of a better pronunciation, was initially developed by the NSA in the early 2000s. And a Reddit user named hash underscore define, who claimed to have had access to Gehydra, said that the tool had been shared with several other U.S. government agencies, mentioning the CIA. That's why it's uh, over the, seven. Over the, right, yeah. over the past few yeah. years. So while there's no explicit announcement yet, that the NSA plans to open source Gehydra as opposed to just make it available. Some believe the agency will also publish Gehydra source code on the NSA's GitHub code repository, which we've mentioned a couple times. There's a, it's an amazing trove over there. Currently, there are 32 released projects, NSA projects, over on their, their GitHub um, port. Uh, so the open source community may, you know, have access to this and be able to maintain it for, for free. So uh, for what it's worth, the buzz about this within the reverse engineering community is that the promise of a good, solid user interface, which apparently is what's missing, even from the, the you know, IDA Pro, which is sort of this, the standard, although it's, it's pricey, uh, and the belief is that it has a strong typing feature set. I'll explain what that's about in a second. Uh, but they're suggesting that, it, that this would fill an important gap that's currently lacking in the, the current reverse engineering tools. Um, 
Ida Pro that I've mentioned, uh, where IDA stands for Interactive Disassembler, uh, is the current favored tool. And I'm sure it's like pirated like crazy because consider its audience. Um, but if you license it, it's eighteen hundred and sixty six dollars and ninety nine cents. What? Yeah. How do they come up with that? I don't, so that was my thought too. One eight six six dot nine nine. I was like, okay, that's what they want. I'm sure, it means something. Uh, so the company that produces Ida Pro is Hex Rays, which is kind of kind of cute, um, and I'm sure that everybody but them will, is delighted at the idea yeah. of the <laughs> NSA releasing something that apparently blows it away. Wow. Okay, so so think about this for those of our listeners who don't know. An ID, so we're all familiar with the term IDE, Integrated Development Environment. An IDA is sort of the reverse. Um, its challenge is the IDA's challenge, the Interactive Disassembler's challenge, is that the act of compiling source code discards so much of the programmer's originally supplied information um, that what you end up with, of course, is the famous pile of ones and zeros. So there have been mistakes made in the past where the debugging information has been almost certainly mistakenly left in the code. That can happen, and in which case, basically, you get the names of all of the things. You get the names of the, you know, the so-called symbol table, which is the mapping between the the, what the programmer called a variable and where the variable is located, what the programmer called a subroutine or a jump point and, and where that is. But normally, and, and, and that's big, that is that, you know, leaving the debugging information in the, in, in the object code makes for a much larger result. So it's almost always the case that that is stripped out. So what you're left with is just ones and zeros, which... You know, and so you're just looking at it, and it's just o an opaque blob. So, so the automated portion of the disassembler can analyze the program's flow. It, it can essentially step through the code. It's not actually doing what the code says. It's not executing the code, but it can it can step through it to see like like find the branches and see where the branches branch to and then essentially build a tree of all of the bytes in the executable that could be executed if every branch was followed and not followed and every jump was taken and every subroutine was called. So it's able to do a, that, that. That's typically called a static analysis. It doesn't run the code. It just it it analyzes it like crazy. To to essentially what that does is it it creates a flow of the code, but it also cr shows what areas cannot be executed, and so it assumes those are data, and. In some cases, then, it can go further. Once it's sort of done that, then it can look and see, oh, look, we're, we're moving something to, uh, in, to, with an instruction that moves something to memory, and it knows the address of that. So it's able to provisionally label that as a variable of some sort. It doesn't know what to call it yet, so it just gives it a, sort of a, a temporary name. So the idea is that the, the automated portion is able to go through – and without, without understanding what the program does, without ever executing a single line, it's able to sort of, sort of unfold it, sort of unwrap it into pieces. And it's able to say, you know, th this is data, this is, these are instructions. And then, and we've, we've showed snippets of, of this, of, of a disassembler output uh, many times in the past in some of our, our, our coverage. It's able to then graphically create like blocks where there are, you know, typically there's a, an arrow coming in and then a block of code and then maybe one or two arrows going out to where like places that that block jumps to that goes to other blocks. So it can sort of 
allow you to move around graphically. But the other thing that can happen now that we have operating systems with known APIs is that a good disassembler will will see, oh, look, that OS is being called to read the registry here because that's a known operating system call and the parameters that that, fu that that operating system call requires are known. So that allows it to, to further reverse engineer and go, well, this has to be the, the, the handle to the key, which has already been opened. So we can, we can label that a, a, a registry key handle. This has to be the name of the of the key that's being opened underneath the the handle so we can label that now and so so as a consequence of the fact that we know all, everything about what the, pro, the the functions that the program calls in the operating system that again further really gives us a, a foothold on what's going on but there's a limit of course to to how much can be done with automation it can it can't understand anything, but it can really go a long way toward toward setting things up and getting it ready to be understood, which is where the interactive portion comes in. Then a, a human, a, uh, a hacker, uh, somebody at the NSA, or somebody, basically anyone who wants to reverse engineer and understand somebody else's compiled code. Uh, I mean, you know, certainly all of the people that are t taking malware apart in order to understand what it's doing and how it works. And we, we, we're talking about this all the time. <clears throat> they're, they're using this sort of tool. So then they'll take a look at, at one of these blocks and, and see what registry, for example, to, to continue the example I was drawing, see what registry functions are being used look at the at the actual name of the key that's being read or written and then think aha and so sort of like that that tells them what you know like what's actually happening and so what you can do is you can with all of the the help that the automation portion was able to provide you sit there and you start filling in the blanks you say well if this registry key is reading this into here, then this here must be named that. And so you start giving things names. And as you do, the, the disassembler will propagate all the other instances of that throughout the code. And basically, although it's not, a, it's not completely automated, working interactively with one, uh, it's very possible to to make a really good stab at at reverse compiling, essentially reversing the process of all of the information that was lost when the compiler discarded all of the labels that the programmer had had put on things in order to make their own code intelligible to themselves, which the computer doesn't need. So anyway, I um. I'm sure we're going to be talking about this on the 12th, which is the the podcast after March 5th, where this will be uh, announced and made available. And I have a feeling it's going to be very popular. I mean, if they've done, you know, they're touting this as commercial grade GUI, and it it is arguably it is that aspect of it. It's the ease of use GUI side, which. Most of these reverse assembly tools um, don't really finish out. So uh, I, this is very exciting. I, uh, I think it's going to probably – and it's interesting that they're choosing to do this. Maybe, Leo, as you noted, it's because, well, the cat was already out of the bag a little bit with the CIA WikiLeaks Vault 7 stuff. Um, so they thought, well, what the heck, let's, you know, yeah, yeah. Let's formally announce it at, at RSA. But <clears throat> very cool. Yeah.